1947. High above the west coast of the United States, a strange foreign aircraft appears in the sky. For the first time, American airspace has been penetrated by an airplane flying non-stop from communist Russia. This is the story of how Soviet designers of the World War II era worked in secret to create amazing planes that were ahead of the rest of the world. Flying submarines, flying tanks, ramjet fighters, and invisible aircraft. And how they worked as slaves in prison camps facing daily torture at the hands of the psychotic mass murderer who ruled Soviet Russia, Joseph Stalin. Under the threat of death, and in spite of overwhelming fear, Soviet designers beat the odds, turning out ingenious revolutionary planes that would change aviation history. In 1937, a Russian plane flies non-stop from Moscow over the North Pole to Pearson Field, Washington State, a distance of 7,000 miles. The pilot is Valery Shkalov. His flight shocks America. No one had any warning that the aircraft was even heading toward the coast. The flight caps years of top-secret aviation design, led by ruthless dictator Joseph Stalin. In the 1930s, Stalin felt that the Russian motherland was surrounded by capitalist enemies. His solution was to build up Russia's military and industrial power. In particular, he was interested in new technologies such as aviation. Stalin spent a lot of the national treasury to expand his aviation sector, building aircraft, setting up design bureaus, and also experimenting with new and radical designs. And during this era, he uh, built uh, a number of large aircraft, uh, bombers in particular, which gave the Soviet Union uh, the potential of having uh, a striking power in terms of aviation. Shkalov becomes an overnight sensation in the U.S. He meets Shirley Temple and General George C. Marshall, who will lead America's forces in the coming World War. But behind closed doors, it's a different story. An angry President Roosevelt will ask Marshall how the Soviets have developed a plane capable of striking at American cities. The surprise flight would have far-reaching consequences for U.S. aviation. The Soviet flight was to change United States military history. Congress was on the point of cancelling the B-17 Flying Fortress, the early prototypes of which had crashed. But when they saw what the Russians could do in terms of long-range bombers, they realized America had to have its own B-17. The amazing Russian aircraft that has flown to America is called the Ant-25. It has a wingspan of over 110 feet, wider than the U-2 skyplane of the Cold War era. And it is capable of staying in the air for an incredible two and a half days at a time. Its secret is the long wings, which give it maximum fuel efficiency, also contain the fuel tanks themselves. The fuel makes up a third of the aircraft's total takeoff weight. The designer of this revolutionary aircraft is Andrei Tupolev. Well, Andrei Tupolev was uh, an interesting man. In the course of the 1920s, he emerges as the Soviet Union's premier aircraft designer. Yet Tupolev began his career with a very different sort of vehicle. He invented the world's first aero sled, an incredibly practical device for the Russian climate. In future years, he would use aero sleds to test aircraft engines. Under Tupolev's leadership, a band of brilliant new Russian aircraft designers began to emerge. At first, Stalin was happy to use their work as propaganda for the new Soviet state. They developed the world's most advanced aircraft technology in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Their first successful aircraft was the world's first flying wing. The Big 3 was a revolutionary tailless aircraft with a huge parabola wing configuration. It first flew in 1926 and would inspire a generation of designers. One of these was Alexander Moskaliev. In 1933, the year Hitler comes to power, 
Moskaliev made a breakthrough that was a generation ahead of the rest of the world. He draws up plans for a delta-winged supersonic fighter called the SAM-4 Sigma. Alexander Moskalev is a lesser known Soviet aircraft designer in the 1930s. One of the things he stumbled across, and he used for rather practical reasons, was the Delta wing design, which was a radical innovation for the 1930s. Moskalev wasn't afraid to be completely radical in his design approach. And he had a, an idea that if you could do away with the regular tailplane, that's the horizontal stabilizer in the United States, you would have a better aeroplane because it would weigh less, it would have less drag. A prototype of the Sigma flew in 1936 with a propeller engine. But Moskaliev isn't finished. He begins to develop a rocket motor for a supersonic version. In effect, Moskaliev envisions the first aircraft in the world to break the sound barrier. It is a quest that would obsess the young designer through World War II. The design of the Sigma was perfect for supersonic flight. All he lacked at that time was a powerful enough rocket motor. The huge strides the Russians make in aviation technology come as a shock in the West when they are revealed in combat for the first time during the Spanish Civil War in 1936. Stalin rushes hundreds of the latest Soviet fighter planes to aid the embattled left-wing government against a fascist rising led by General Franco. It is called the I-16, nicknamed the Rat. The new plane looks utterly different from contemporary fighters, which have not changed design since the First World War. It is a monoplane rather than a biplane. It is built for speed and flies 70 miles per hour faster than any other fighter. The I-16, which first flew in 1934, was the first in the world of the new species of monoplane fighter, streamlined, with retractable landing gear and guns in the wings. Everywhere you looked, it was new. But now, something happens that destroys Russia's lead in aviation. Beginning in, in 1937, uh, Stalin presided over a series of show trials in which uh, prominent figures in Soviet life, civil and military, were accused of some outrageous uh, acts of sabotage and treason. Two uh, Soviet Air Force commanders, for example, were arrested and executed in the late 30s. And Andrei Tupolev, the great Soviet designer, was also arrested and uh, sent to prison. Tupolev and his associates are carted off to the infamous Lubyanka prison in Moscow, where they are tortured and forced to sign false confessions. The stock charge was that they had betrayed their trust by selling secret aeroplane designs to somewhere in America or Britain. It was nonsense, but the attitude of Stalin and his henchmen was people work better if they are really scared. One trumped-up charge against Tupolev is that his famous Ant-25 flight to America was a cover to smuggle blueprints of the latest Soviet aircraft out of Russia to sell to Nazi Germany. Stalin was always suspicious of intellectuals, and in particular he thought that scientists were lazy, undisciplined people. He thought they worked best under fear. Uh, so he put them all in prison. He actually created uh, prison camps where the aircraft engineers could go on designing their aircraft but be under the watchful eye of the Soviet Secret Service. One of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's most uh, famous novels is called The First Circle, in which he uses imaginative literature to capture one of the most unusual aspects of the Stalinist purges, the police special prison workshops. And these were set up uh, in the 1930s in which scientists and aircraft designers were technically under arrest, but set up in these special workshops under guard where they worked on high priority projects for the Soviet Union. They work because their families will be arrested and shot if they do not obey. Guards constantly follow the engineers around the workshops. 
It was like living in the Bastille. Uh, you had good food, you even had waitresses, you had cigarettes, you had certain amenities, you slept in uh, clean beds, but you never knew when, if ever, you would get out. You just didn't know what ultimately your fate would be. Yet neither Stalin nor his designers had any inkling how crucially their work would affect their country and world history. On June 22, 1941, over 3 million German troops and 3,300 tanks smashed through the Russian border. This is Operation Barbarossa, Adolf Hitler's attempt to annihilate communist Russia. The first target of Operation Barbarossa was the Soviet Air Force. And on the morning of June 22, 1941, um, the German Luftwaffe attacked forward airfields of the Soviet Union and huge numbers of Soviet aircraft were destroyed in place. The largest air force in the world is wiped out in a single day. What remains of the Red Army's air force is no longer a match for the Luftwaffe's latest models. A month after Barbarossa, Andrei Tupolev and the other Soviet aircraft designers are suddenly freed. In the next few years, they will invent a host of cutting-edge designs that eventually make Russia second only to America as the world's leading aviation power. In the summer of 1941, the Nazi Luftwaffe owns the skies above Soviet Russia. The Russians must buy time to evacuate the Soviet war machine to safety deep in the Ural Mountains. The Soviets need a fast, simple fighter plane that can be built easily in huge numbers. In July 1941, barely a month after the Nazi invasion, the Soviet Aircraft Ministry issues a requirement for such a plane. A prototype must be ready in only 35 days. But this plane will be revolutionary for more than the speed of its development. It will be powered by a rocket engine. Russian interest in rockets goes back to 1903, when mathematician Konstantin Tsiolkovsky published the first scientific paper to suggest that liquid-fueled rockets might be the means to get into outer space. But following the communist revolution in 1917, all public news of Soviet rocket experiments was censored. Now hidden from the world, the Soviets set up a special organization to conduct research into military rocket propulsion. It was called the RNII, short for the Russian words for Rocket Scientific Research Institute. This institute was set up in 1933 and reflected in many ways the uh, long and abiding interest uh, Russians had in space travel and in rocketry. And it would draw a number of uh, important figures, not the least of which was Sergei Korolev, who would later head up the Soviet space program. In the 1930s, Korolev was the RNII's leading engineer, working on gyro-stabilized rockets, air-to-air -air missiles, and even rocket-powered aircraft. The Nazis had repeated failures with their own rockets. As a result, German military intelligence dismissed reports of Soviet success with rocket flight as pure fantasy. Unknown to the rest of the world, until after World War II, the Soviet Union was the world leader in rocketry and certainly in aspirations for spaceflight. And Sergei Korolev was one of the leading lights in rocket engines. Sergei Korolev uh, is an interesting figure, uh, Ukrainian by background, went to the Kiev Polytechnical School, uh, and then uh, came to Moscow in the 1930s, became interested in aviation, uh, tinkered around with gliders and aviation designs. But his real passion was rocketry, and he was very much interested in um, developing rocket-powered aircraft. In 1936, Korolev began work on the RP-218, a rocket-powered research aircraft designed to fly to the edge of space. The crew would be encased in a specially sealed and pressurized cockpit, and the plane would be launched from the underside of a bomber. It was an idea that wouldn't hit America for another 20 years. Early versions of the X-15 copied the mission profile planned for Korolev's RP-218, 
reaching an altitude of nearly 40 miles high. But before Korolev could get his plane off the ground, the curse of Stalin's paranoia strikes again. The designer is arrested on false treason charges. He is sent to the gold fields of Kalima in the far northwest of Siberia. Known as the land of white death, Kalima is the coldest place on Earth, with temperatures plummeting to nearly 100 degrees below zero. Korolev was rescued by the intervention of Andrei Tupolev. Tupolev was still back in prison in Moscow, but he saw it as his task to rescue all of the young Soviet aircraft designers who had been scattered through the Gulag and bring them back to Moscow where they could work under reasonably benign conditions, though still in prison. Others are not so lucky. Many of the key research workers at the RNII Rocket Research Institute are executed. With their deaths, the visionary RP-218 is abandoned. But then in 1941, with the Nazi invasion, Russia turns back to rocket power. She needs a fast, rocket-powered fighter aircraft to combat the marauding Luftwaffe. The trouble with a rocket is it gets through its fuel very quickly, so you're not going to stay up there very long. But it does open the way to unbeatable performance, which is just what you want if the enemy bombers are coming over at high altitude and you want to go and take off quickly, climb up and shoot some of them down. A lot of Russian designers took this idea on board. The new plane is called the B.I. Its nickname is the Devil's Broomstick. The B.I. is powered by a rocket motor generating 2,500 pounds of thrust, more powerful than the first generation of jet engines. It is armed with two 20-millimeter cannons on the nose and reaches speeds of nearly 600 miles per hour. It is the fastest aircraft on Earth. Working round the clock, the design team has the first prototype ready by late 1941, only a few months after the Nazi invasion. The BI is being developed at a plant near Moscow, but the advancing German troops are headed toward the Soviet capital. Work on the BI is halted in a desperate bid to move the aircraft and its workforce to the safety of Sverdlovsk, 850 miles east of Moscow. The disruption means the first BI fighter is only ready to fly under rocket power on May 15, 1942. The test pilot is Grigory Bakchivanzi, a Soviet fighter ace. The Devil's Broomstick shoots upward at 500 miles per hour. The world's first rocket-propelled combat plane has flown. The B-1 rocket plane was uh, debuted in 1942. It was a rocket-powered um, aircraft, plywood construction. Uh, it was designed to be an interceptor, to intercept German bombers. And a number of these were built and flown. Stalin immediately orders the BI into production. Meanwhile in Germany, work has also begun on a rocket-powered fighter, the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet. But the operational version of the Comet will not fly till 1943, nearly 18 months after the Soviet rocket plane. But the new rocket technology proves difficult to perfect, while the years of delay in which Stalin butchered the cream of Russia's rocket engineers has not helped. One problem is that a rocket motor uses up fuel at a great rate. In a bid to solve this problem, designers mount ramjet engines to the wingtips of the BI. These can be used in ordinary flight, with the rocket motor switched on to climb to altitude or in the attack mode. Then another problem emerges. On March 27, 1943, Grigory Bakchivanzi takes off on a routine test flight. It will be his last. By 1943, seven BI-1 prototypes had been built. They had flown extremely well at remarkable speeds, and not least was their ability to climb roughly twice as fast as any other fighter in the world. Unfortunately, later in 1943, 
uh, the test pilot, Bakshi Vanji, was making a very fast, low-level pass. It went into a dive at something like 500 miles an hour, and it set up a longitudinal oscillation, climbing and diving. The pilot had no chance whatsoever. The Russians had stumbled into one of the major problems of supersonic or near-supersonic flight. As an aircraft approaches the sound barrier, a wall of heavy air builds up in front of the wing, and that can cause control problems and force the aircraft into a dive. Unable to solve the problems, work on the BI is stopped. The 50 BI fighters under construction are scrapped. The Devil's Broomstick is consigned to history's dustbin. But Soviet engineers remain fascinated with rocket power. Rocket boosters are fitted to most standard Red Air Force fighters to add speed. And in 1943, Russia's top rocket expert, Sergei Karolov, develops a new liquid-fueled rocket motor. It is tested on a special version of the PE-2 bomber. These breakthroughs in rocket technology enable Alexander Moskaliev to resume his quest for a supersonic delta-winged fighter. Russian designers were given a pretty free hand sometimes. Three of them designed aeroplanes named Strela, which means arrow. And they were always of a, an advanced delta wing design, triangular. And one of these was a rocket fighter designed by Moskaliev. And it would have been, I think, a world beater because it might have exceeded the speed of sound had a very powerful rocket engine. Moskaliev's latest project is to be powered by two liquid-fueled rocket motors, each with four and a half thousand pounds of thrust. Russian fighters generally were smaller than the British and American fighters. They were rather similar in size to the Germans, but they tended to have bigger engines, so often they were faster. And though they didn't have many guns, these guns were world beaters. They were super heavy, fast-firing, high-muzzle-velocity cannon. You only needed one hit, and you probably had scored. By 1944, the Red Air Force is on the offensive, and Luftwaffe bombers are no longer capable of threatening Moscow. Stalin decides that the Strailer is no longer needed, and Moskaliev's design workshop is closed down by the secret police. The supersonic rocket fighter is abandoned, and Moskaliev is lucky to escape with his life. Yet, despite the constant danger of being arrested if you have radical ideas, Soviet aircraft designers go on to propose unorthodox solutions to problems. Even by today's standards, their ideas are astonishing. On the eve of World War II, Russian collective farm workers turn their eyes skyward. They think they can hear the sound of an approaching aircraft, but they can see nothing. Flying overhead is the world's first attempt at a stealthy aircraft. Well, the Soviet aircraft designers are always interested in imaginative, forward-looking, futuristic types of airplanes. In fact, in the 1930s, curiously, they even had some experiments on building an invisible airplane. These are the days before radar, but the aircraft of the day are still visible targets. They fly slow enough to be spotted easily through binoculars, and they fly too low to escape the deadly attention of anti-aircraft artillery. One Soviet designer has an answer. He strips the Soviet Air Force plane of its outer covering of wood and replaces it with clear plastic. It was a four-seat, single-engine, high-wing monoplane, a very ordinary aeroplane. He stripped out as much as he could of all the existing structure, and he covered it with a transparent fabric which he got from France called Rhodoid, which was very much like cellophane. The aircraft is now largely transparent to the human eye. Of course, the engine and crew can still be seen. But at altitude, they are too small to pick out. There is only one problem. The problem was that the plastic he was using reacted to sunlight. And after a few weeks, uh, the transparency was lost and you could see the plane again. 
A true stealthy aircraft will have to wait another 50 years. Another problem Soviet aircraft engineers are grappling with is airborne warfare. The Red Army is the first to create a large parachute force. But paratroopers are lightly armed and defenseless against enemy tanks. There are early attempts to carry light tanks and artillery into battle, slung under heavy bombers. But the aircraft cannot transport heavy weapons. Another brilliant Soviet engineer has a radical solution to this problem. He is Oleg Antonov. Oleg Antonov emerged as one of the Soviet Union's most prominent aircraft designers in the 20th century. As a young man, he was interested in gliders. Later on, he presided over the design of a whole series of Soviet aircraft transports, heavy lift aircraft. His most, uh, perhaps his most unusual project was a so-called flying tank, where they uh, attached uh, wings to literally a tank and used it as a, a, a flying machine. This strange aircraft is called the KT, which stands for tank's wings in Russian. A T-60 tank provides the fuselage of the unit, with the tank's tracks being the landing gear. A biplane wing made of wood and fabric is attached, together with a pair of tail booms for stability. The unit is towed to its target by a heavy bomber. Towing speed is 100 miles per hour. Over the target, the flying tank is released and glides to a landing near the battlefield. The wings are dropped as soon as the tank lands. The tank can then move instantly into combat. Only one KT was ever built, and this was tested in early 1942. And the pilot was one of the most varied and experienced pilots has ever been, Sergei Anakhin. And they waved away the tug, off went the, uh, the combination, and Anakin broke the tow rope at about uh, 6,000 feet, and he managed to steer this contraption back to the airfield. And we are told he made a rather rough landing. Well, if, if the idea is if it's a landing you can walk away from, it's a landing. It would be the only flight of the flying tank. The problem was not the concept of a flying tank that you could tow. The problem was there were not powerful enough engines for the towing aircraft to really fly the tank any great distance. Russia's tanks will have to drive to Berlin under their own steam. But along with flying tanks, Soviet thinking about the use of aircraft for naval warfare would lead to another idea that is truly breathtaking. Early submarines were very slow. They were also vulnerable to attack while traveling on the surface to recharge their electric batteries. On the other hand, aircraft could fly fast and high, but they did not have a submarine's invisibility when submerged. The junior naval officers uh, in the Soviet Union were very resourceful. And in the early 30s, they came up with the idea, of why not combine the strengths of a submarine with the strengths of an aircraft? In July 1936, the Soviet military's main scientific research committee approves a detailed design study for a flying submarine. It is known as the LPL, after the Russian letters for flying submarine aircraft. For flight, the LPL is powered by three conventional piston engines. It carries a crew of three and flies at 150 miles per hour with a range of 500 miles. When the aircraft lands on water, Panels close to seal the flight engines. The aircraft is painted with corrosion-resistant materials, and it is armed with two 18-inch torpedoes carried under the fuselage. When submerged, the machine has a speed of three knots. The idea was that the flying submarine would be able to penetrate a heavily defended harbor by flying over the mines and the submarine nets, then submerge and attack the battleships and aircraft carriers that thought they were in safety inside the harbor. But the technical challenges prove too much for the Russians, and the flying sub is never completed. The idea of a flying submarine sounds far-fetched, but in fact, during the Cold War in the 1950s, the United States Navy commissioned its own design study for a flying submarine. The Convair Division of General Dynamics Corp in San Diego was asked to draw up plans for just such an aircraft this time powered by a jet engine. 
the craft would be submerged by flooding the wings, tail, and hull compartments. It would travel five miles an hour underwater, powered by batteries. The flying submarine has never got off the drawing board because it's just too complicated an engineering project. But there was one other new technology that did revolutionize aviation in World War II, the jet plane. In the 1930s, Soviet aircraft designers realized that to attain greater speeds, they will need to develop new kinds of engines. The limiting speed for any aircraft using a propeller is about 500 miles per hour. Soon, the Soviets lead the world in the development of the ramjet. Various designers had ideas for rockets and for weird things called ramjets. They're really just tubes, but with a careful profile, big inlet, then it, it narrows to a high velocity section in the middle where you inject fuel, which burns, and expands through an enlarged tailpipe to give thrust. The basic idea couldn't be simpler. It's as simple as a rocket engine. A ramjet uses the forward speed of an aircraft in flight to squeeze air into a nozzle. This compressed air is rich in explosive oxygen. There was quite a bit to be said for putting ramjets under the wings or in the tail of a fighter to boost the speed. Hardly anybody ever did it except the Russians, and they did it in a big way. Early ramjets are tried out on the I-16 fighter. These experiments prove successful. Stalin orders a new ramjet fighter. Work begins in 1940. The result is one of the most advanced and beautiful aircraft designs of the Second World War, the Barakov D fighter. The Barakov D uh, was uh, a 1941 uh, aircraft design. It was a twin boom aircraft with a, a 2,000 horsepower pusher engine, a piston powered engine, supplemented with ramjets and armed with 20 and 37 millimeter uh, cannon. The plane includes a host of revolutionary features. As well as ramjets fitted in the twin tail booms, it has swept wings and is even equipped with an ejector seat. Had the Barovkov D been ready in 1941, its speed and firepower could have destroyed the lumbering Luftwaffe bombers and easily evaded German fighters. But the aircraft will never take to the air. The German attack on the Soviet Union comes before it is ready. Soviet designers discover that ramjets have a drawback. They eat fuel. The search is on for a better solution to the speed question. The answer is the pure jet engine. The Soviets begin building jet engines as early as 1938, years before America will start its own jet program. The father of the Soviet jet engine is Archip Lyulka. Nobody knew at that time that a lot of jet engine work was going on in Germany and even in the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, it was a man called Archip Lyulka, who, in fact, had a superb design for an engine. A very simple centrifugal compressor design, which he improved and extended, and by about 1938, he had an axial compressor in 1938, Lyulka is working on developing a compressor for the new Tupolev PE-8 heavy bomber. This compressor is designed to suck in oxygen at high altitudes to feed the ordinary piston engines of the bomber. Having developed his compressor to suck in the oxygen for the piston engine, Lyulka then had a brainwave. Why not dispense with the heavy piston engine and instead inject kerosene directly into the compressed oxygen? The result is a pure jet engine. Lyulka independently has invented the power plant that will transform the future of aviation. Stalin is impressed with Lyulka's work. He orders the engine to be ready by December 1940. Work immediately begins on a jet fighter to be powered by the new Lyulka jet engine. Russian engineers come up with a unique design, 
Air is fed into the jet engine through a tipped nose with four separate intakes. But the new jet technology proves more complicated than Lyoka bargains for. His engine takes longer to perfect than he thinks. By 1943, Lilka had a testbed engine running in the workshop, which was as powerful as anything in the world. But a military jet requires endurance in the air, and at that point, he didn't have the alloys, the metals, that would allow a jet engine to work under combat conditions. By 1943, it is still only 70% ready. Brooding in the Kremlin, Stalin grows impatient. He decides the war will be won by brute force, not new technology. The Good Cop fighter project was cancelled in 1943. By that time, Stalin was convinced he could win the war using conventional aircraft, of which hundreds of thousands were being turned out from Soviet factories. With sheer weight of numbers, the Red Air Force wins back control of the Russian skies from the Germans. But as World War II draws to a close, there is yet another twist in the story of Russian jet aviation. The first Russian jets do go into combat on the Eastern Front, but they are flying for the Nazis. The first Russians to fly jets in combat were flying on the Nazi side. The Germans had recruited a free Russian air force from volunteer Russian pilots who wanted to free their country from Stalin and they were equipped with the revolutionary new Messerschmitt Me 262 jet fighter. Apart from the Luftwaffe, the Free Russian Air Force is the only other air arm to fly the Me 262, the world's first operational combat jet. They fly in the old colors of Imperial Russia. But nothing can now save Adolf Hitler from his fate. In early 1945, the Red Army smashes into German territory for the first time. And Tupolev's heavy bombers pound Berlin. But Stalin harbors a secret that will lead to yet another purge of Russia's aircraft designers. Korea, 1950. U.S. jet fighters in action are World War II vintage Lockheed F-80 shooting stars. The Americans expect to clear the skies of communist planes. But they find themselves outclassed by a new Russian fighter that is faster and more nimble. The amazing MiG-15. Suddenly, there were glinting little silver things high over the Yalu River in Korea, and they were faster and agile. And this was the MiG-15. It had huge, powerful cannon. One hit from those, so you were a goner. Rumors abound that the MiG is a copy of a Nazi jet design, the Focke Wolf TA-183. The two planes look remarkably similar. Western experts simply didn't believe that Russian aircraft designers were good enough to design a jet fighter. So they automatically assumed that it must have come from the German designers captured by the Russians at the end of the war. But now the truth can be revealed. The MiG-15 was not a copy of the TA-183. Its designer, Hans Muhlthorpe, had actually been captured by the British and brought secretly to England. So who did design the fantastic MiG-15? The MiG-15 was nothing to do with German designers. It was the work of two brilliant young Soviet designers, Artem Mikoyan and Mikhail Gurevich, who were willing to court the wrath of Stalin to push the boundaries out on new ideas. In December 1939, Mikoyan and Gurevich formed their own company. It is called MiG after their initials. Their first plane is the amazing MiG-1, a high-altitude interceptor. But this is soon followed by a far more radical design. Late in the war, they build an advanced version of the German Comet rocket fighter using captured Nazi plans. And then, as the war draws to a close, they build a very strange aircraft. Until now, their most secret, the MiG-8. One of the weirdos of World War II was the MiG-8 named the Utka, which means duck. And it was a light aeroplane. The MiG test pilots enjoyed it, despite its funny shape. 
If they had to go to a Red Air Force unit, they would take one of the Utkas. The MiG-8 was designed as a simple training aircraft, but that was just a deception to fool Stalin. If you look at the design, it's got swept back wings, and that's exactly what you need for supersonic flight. In other words, this was a supersonic test bed. Using what they have learned from the MiG-8, the MiG-15 flies in December 1947, barely two years after the end of the Second World War. I knew the Spitfire very well. And in 1947-48, I sat in a Russian fighter cockpit and I thought, gosh, it's like a Rolls Royce. It was exactly the opposite of what I expected. It was beautifully made and very lavishly equipped. So we had it all wrong. But as the Cold War grows even more dangerous, Soviet Russia faces a new generation of advanced Western combat jets. An aging Stalin is convinced his own aircraft designers are betraying him. The purges and executions start again. Once more, designers like Andrei Tupolev fear the midnight knock on the door from the secret police. Then suddenly on March 5, 1953, Stalin dies. And at last, Russia's aircraft designers, caught for decades in a web of torture and intimidation, are finally free to do their best work. Oleg Antonov, the designer of the flying tank of World War II, is free to pursue his dream of flying tanks into battle. His company would build some of the world's largest production aircraft, among them the Antonov 24 and the Antonov 124, also known as the Ruslan. This can carry 150 tons of cargo, including every main Soviet battle tank. Sergei Karlov, the genius behind Russia's pre-war rocket research and the designer of the RP-218, becomes the head of the entire Soviet space program and sends the first man into space. Andrei Tupolev, designer of the amazing Ant-25 that flew non-stop to America back in 1937, will survive to build the first supersonic passenger jet to fly, the Tu-144 Konkordsky. It uses the slender Delta Wing, first invented by Alexander Moskaliev in 1933, and is powered by four massive turbojets, direct descendants of those devised by Archip Lyulka in 1943. The Russians gradually showed that they were as good as anybody else. And by 1940, 42, 43, they were in production with their newer aircraft. And in many respects, they were as good as anything that we had. They were way ahead of us, far ahead with armament. Their guns were far better than ours. And they've, they've always kept that position right to this day. The Soviet Air Force in World War II had been uh, the, the first victim of the German invasion in 1941. Yet out of the ashes of Operation Barbarossa, the Soviet Air Force would come back with new aircraft, uh, new designs. And by the end of the war, uh, the Soviet Air Force had emerged as a rather muscular and effective air arm of the Soviet military. So why did Stalin show this consuming hatred and fear of his aircraft designers? The truth turns out to be very simple. He uh, was very fearful of flying. He only flew once, in fact, and that was in 1943 to the Tehran conference to meet Churchill and Roosevelt. During the flight, the aircraft hit an air pocket and bounced, and clearly Stalin was terrified. I think his fear of flying, his phobia, is very probably one of the things that influences this terrible way he treats the Soviet aircraft designers. Russia's aircraft engineers have always been among the world's most gifted. Under Joseph Stalin, their genius was perverted and then betrayed by a madman who was too frightened to fly. Yet the aviation contributions of Russia's aircraft designers would be one of the most enduring legacies of World War II. It's the most used room in the house with a long winding history. 
In medieval times, bathing was scarce. Maybe once a year. The 1900s, dangerous. A naked flame that scorched the bottom of your behind. And before toilet paper, frightening. People used their hands. Bathroom technology on Modern Marvels, tonight at 10 on the History Channel.